the first topic that um, we're starting with today, and I'll use that to then repeat and 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 come back to a couple of things about branching and collaborative um, workflows that I didn't get to uh, talk about that detail yesterday uh, is um, publishing data sets. So once you have this data set, how can you share your work with others? And that will include a couple of, of technical terms, a couple of concepts. Um, one uh, are repository hosting services. So um, web services that offer to host Git repositories such as GitLab, GitHub, um, Jin. The concept of siblings, which is a remote clone of data sets of a data set that is linked to your data set that you can either update by pushing new changes, publishing new changes, or update from by, um, by pulling or, or retrieving changes that your sibling has that you don't have locally. Um, and a command that is also called data let push um, to do these kinds of updates. Um, the idea between, uh, behind data lab when it was first conceived uh, I don't know, more than a decade ago, was to be able to share data like source code. Um, so having a means to um, being able to quickly distribute any kind of data of any size in a streamlined fashion. Um, and uh, you've seen this. I'm getting some audio feed from someone I can't identify. Can you please mute yourself? Okay, thanks. Um, so I've, I've shown you this, this overview graphic yesterday already. Um, you are able with Git repositories in general, um, and thus also data led data sets, to have a network of linked data sets, Git repositories that can get updates from each other um, or push updates uh, to each other. Uh, and those can exist on compute infrastructure, such as your local machine, uh, your institution server, but also web services, uh, such as cloud infrastructure um, or hosting services, such as GitHub, GitHub uh, or GitLab. Um, examples of these different um, yeah, places are uh, given in these little code snippets below, just so you have an idea of what I'm talking about when I when I talk about local path or remote paths. So a local path could look something like this. Uh, in this case, this is a relative path on a Unix-based system. You can see that it's just uh, um, a pointer on a file system that identifies um, a directory. So this is Unix um, speak and says one directory up into the directory my projects into the directory experiment data if you have a windows computer then you will put the slashes in the opposite direction <laughs> um, but in general this is this is how a path looks like it can also be absolute then it starts with a slash or with the drive if you are on windows on windows you have like the c drive or a d drive that is at the start on unix or unix computers you just have a slash that identifies the very start of the file system and then you have chain all of the directories as kind of a description on how to reach your target directory. And if experiment data is a data led data set, then by providing such a path to the data led clone command um, or a data led create sibling command, you are able to retrieve this data set as a clone or to publish this data set as a clone to this local path. There are also remote paths. Those are the same concept of paths, but they point to a different system that can be reached, for example, via the internet. So if you have a high throughput computing system, a server where your university's IT people make computer infrastructure available to you to store your experiment data or to run analysis, then you can usually um, address this server uh, with this kind of notation here. You have a username and then you have this at and then you have the IP address or a domain name, so a human readable um, name that redirects to that IP address of your HPC system. And on that system, that's typically a Linux-based system, you then 
uh, have such a local path that identifies a data set a directory on the remote system. When we're talking about hosting services, the um, paths or URLs rather that are uh, used to um, identify uh, the data sets or the data set um, to be is uh, taking the form of, of a URL. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the different forms that this URL can take. It depends a bit on the protocol that is used, um, but um, such a GitHub URL uh, might be something that uh, you have already seen before if you have ever cloned a Git repository uh, from GitHub where you have a user account. And then there are also external so-called special remotes. I'm going to explain that term in a little while. And they have a special kind of format that you will not be able to see, or you will probably not have seen that before. It's oftentimes something that we have established where you just need to read the documentation and find out what the right format is. Um, so for example, if you want to talk to the open science framework with data led, then you will use a URL with a little bit of a special format that has an OSF for open science framework prefix, and then your OSF project ID. So these are just the major, you know, um, locations remotely or locally that we can interact with. Um, I've also shown you this graphic here yesterday. It kind of exemplifies the idea that DataLed tries to be a connecting network um, that aims to make life of researchers a little bit easier. So all of us do research, we create data, we, we analyze data and so forth. And all of our work functions without DataLed. Um, whatever you've used to previously share data with a collaborator, it has worked. You know, you have your 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 means. You might send around USB sticks. You might have a Google Drive to share stuff. You might have a specific university install provider that is paid by your university to um, allocate storage space and cloud services and so forth. Um, and and that's that's all nice and working. And DataLed tries to be a little bit of an unobstructive network that gives you the ability to keep using the provider that you use anyway, um, but streamline the commands you use to uh, retrieve or publish data. So if you are using Google Drive to, to publish or to share your data and you decide to use DataLed, then you can still use that Google Drive. Or if you're an ADAPT OSF user, then you can stay an ADAPT OSF user. It's just that uh, in addition to the usual workflows that you have um, that you have uh, adapted to, you can also uh, do um, data-led commands to achieve the same or a very similar thing. Um, and if you, you know, I can't walk you through all of the different providers, um, but if you're interested in, in walkthroughs, tutorials, how to use uh, a large amount of different providers, then you can go to um, this link here, third party infrastructure in the handbook. It's a complete chapter, and that shows you how to do it with an S3 bucket, also how to do it with Dropbox, and so forth and so forth. So, when we're talking about publication, there are three major um, locations. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, three major locations that, that are involved in this process. One, the repository hosting services. The major ones that you may have heard about are GitHub or GitLab. And then there's also something that's called Bitbucket. And um, this here is Jin. We will talk about that uh, very much today. Um, what's also involved are third-party storage providers. Those third-party storage providers are free or commercial um, cloud infrastructures that you typically offer you to host your data in the cloud. So on some server, if you are syncing your Android phone's photos with the Google Cloud, then that's a third party storage provider. And then you have the compute infrastructure that you have access to. So um, your local computer, your workstation, your desktop computer, or the server that you may have access on. And the question is, how can we get the data set that maybe sits on your local computer 
now to be able to interact with these different locations. And here's a quick glossary of the things that, that I'll, I'll be talking about. One is a sibling, uh, a different term for that is also remote. And a sibling or a remote is a linked clone of a data set. When you have a sibling, you can add that by hand or it is added automatically. You can update that sibling's changes uh, or you um, can update um, the sibling with changes that your, your local data set has that the sibling doesn't. It's a way of synchronizing across linked across a linked network of data sets. So that's um, one thing where there's that's, for example, really handy. It's an, a kind of backup scenario um, where you, let's say, have an ongoing data acquisition, you acquire EEG data, and every day there's a new participant. So the first place where this data um, is, is appearing is the experiment computer, and then you save it there, and then you synchronize it with a lot of backup locations. For example, um, the cluster, the server, um, or the external hard drive or your own computer where you might anal analyze that data. The repository hosting services, the web services that host Git repositories and because data sets are Git repositories, also data sets. Uh, third party storage, I've already given some examples of that. Um, and uh, a term that I use um, when I talk about third party party storage providers in the context of data sets is also special remote. So a special remote uh, is, is a special term. It's, it's a highly technical term. I don't have a different uh, term for that. Um, but when I refer to a special remote, I mean um, a way of communication to a third party storage provider that allows me to deposit data there. Um, the reason why it's called special remote is that the term remote refers to any Git repository on a remote location such as GitHub. Um, but because third party storage providers typically do not have the ability to store Git repositories, they are not a hosting service. You can just put all of your movie movies there, all of your pictures, but they do not have support for Git repositories. We're calling that special remote in a way to refer to um, to, to using them in a special way that still allows us uh, to, to place contents or complete Git repositories on them, even though they are not technically made with the intention of hosting those. So and then- the Repository hosting service is lived here as a, as a separate category, is, the, is that they are able to talk in Git language, so they recognize repositories, they recognize branches, uh, they have the idea of commits, and they are able to communicate uh, with Git's protocol to transfer the repository information. Uh, the third part, third party storage like uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, S3 do not have this ability, and therefore uh, a special remote uh, is a way of Git annex to talk to these places to send the data, so, so to speak, in the not Git part. Yeah, exactly. Um, when I use the term publishing data sets, then, uh, or pushing data sets, then uh, I mean the process of running the command data let push to, um, yeah, literally push any kind of change, be that annex contents or um, uh, changes in my in my Git revision history, to any uh, registered sibling to any other uh, repository, and when I use the term updating datasets, then I mean uh, using a command that is called data let update update dash dash merge to integrate changes that a sibling has into my local dataset, and by that. You know, getting getting the updates from from that sibling or pulling the updates from that sibling. If you are using Git, it's the same thing as running a Git pull. Um, so when we, I need to again give a little bit of an overview of the different ways to achieve one and the same thing with different services 
uh, in data sets. So when we when we take a look at the infrastructure of services that we integrate or interact with, then um, most public data sets that you are able to consume separate the content that is stored in Git and the content that is stored in the annex of the data set. So this distinction uh, that exists locally on your data set that is also upheld in the way these data sets are um, stored or available from other places. And that's because of limitations in the services that we use. So the repository hosting services that store Git repositories, they typically don't support annexed contents. We've seen that in this screenshot where I'm trying to, you know, um, push a file that's too large in a Git repository to GitHub. And you can immediately see GitHub rejecting that. Uh, GitHub does not like to host large data. Um, and so it also does not have annex support. What repository hosting services mostly do is take the Git part and host that really efficiently, really nicely, and provide a lot of collaborative um, features. And they provide you with the opportunity to expose your data sets so that you can go to this publicly available GitHub, GitLab repository and find a link to clone from, which is a very convenient way for um, both you to expose data sets and for others to find those data sets and consume them. Uh, on the other hand, the storage hosting services, that uh, is something that Micha already just um, explained, they do not have the ability to host the Git part that conveniently. They do not have the support, the Git terminology. Um, they are simply there to hold digital blobs of data. Um, and what in, happens in the typical case is that the annexed content, the annexed part of your data set, that lives on some storage hosting place uh, where there is support to simply store digital blobs and the repository hosting place that contains the Git part of your data set and exposes everything. Because that sounds like it's a quite complex operation that involves synchronizing different elements, different, different locations for you as someone who, um, who, who maintains the data set. There's something that we call a publication dependency, uh, which is uh, the data led way of linking a special remote to so a third party storage provider uh, together with the repository hosting service. It's a configuration that you uh, can apply to let your data set know, I want to have the Git part on GitHub. I want to have the annex part in this S3 bucket. And once you have established that connection, the updating and pulling and pushing will automatically query both of those locations so that you still only need to talk to um, it seems one place and the synchronizing of the publication of your, any large data is more or less um, handled automatically without you having to you know, talk to uh, these, these other services explicitly. So the typical case, you have a private or a public repository on a repository hosting service. And because the data can't be stored there, it is stored in almost any kind of third party storage. And then you have a configuration that you run to tell your repository where to publish to, for example, G drive, for example, S3. And once you have set that up, it's uh, either a separate configuration or it is part of a, of a data led command, then every data led push will automatically update everything that is necessary, including, including the, um, the data contents. Here's how that looks like. I'm going to show you the examples that I've shown you yesterday and just uh, talk about um, what, what actually happens in the background. So um, this year was a data set that I've, sh I've, I've shown you. It is a data set that uh, the lab that I'm a part of has, has published uh, many, many years ago. You can clone it from GitHub. It's a Git public Git repository and the data is completely public. So anyone can retrieve the data. And the data that is part of this repository, uh, that one is hosted on a data pub 
that uh, on the server that our institution provides us with to, um, to, to host data. And it is also hosted on the German neuroinformatics node. And uh, actually this, this data, uh, those data holdings, we uh, switched institutions uh, three years ago. We used to be in Magdeburg. So initially those data holdings were hosted on a server in Magdeburg and then we changed to institutions and simply um, also changed the, the server that held our data, but we were able to just update the location information of those data sets so that the GET will still retrieve the data, even though the underlying hosting um, has changed. The uh, next example was how we handle large neuroscientific data sets that require a data usage agreement that our data manager in our institute downloads for us and then provides for the researchers to, um, to download and use. We have a private GitLab instance, so only institute members can access, access that GitLab instance. Um, and if they can, uh, then they can clone the data set that holds all of the data, um, but only onto the cluster because the data, because it needs to be kept private, it cannot be publicly exposed, is hosted on our private servers and only accessible to institute members. So as long as I'm on our compute server, I am able to get those files, those data sets. If I'm on my local computer, I do not have the required permissions. Um, to, to retrieve them. And then the next uh, real life example, and that's the Human Connectom project. So if you've used with, if you've worked with that data, you know that the Human Connectom project requires you to read a license and, and you know, sign that you adhere to their data usage agreement. And their data is hosted on S3 buckets. And with DataLed, you can clone this data set. And once you want to retrieve data, you will be asked for your credentials that um, assert that you have actually signed this DOA, DUA. And once, once those credentials are provided, uh, you will be able to download the data. So that's like a mix. Uh, it's princi in principle available to the public, but only if you know you have the, the signed data usage agreement. Um, there is a special case in publishing, and that's a really, really wonderful thing. There are certain repository hosting services that actually do have annex support and don't require the separation of your data set contents and the Git parts of your data set. And the one that uh, we'll be also using later today is called Jin. I've asked you in this little participant survey on whether this is a service that's known to you and most people have indicated that they've never heard of it. So I'm quite glad that I can provide you with, um, with this piece of information about the service because I think it's, it's, a, really cool, it's a really cool service. It's the um, German neuroinformatics node that is uh, creating a little bit of a German GitHub. Um, what makes Jin special is that it has NX support and thus uh, can hold the NX data in addition to the Git part of your repository. And it exposes the Git history, but also all of the NX files, including um, a nice little web-based preview of those files. And importantly, it's completely free. It's an academic infrastructure that the University of Munich provides. A different special case are special remotes, third party um, uh, storages that have support for repository hosting. Um, and that's uh, typically not implemented in those places. So the way that we make this work is by writing special software that, that, um, that makes it possible. Uh, so uh, in the case of the open science framework, we have created what is called a data led extension. A data led extension is a separate Python software. So we have the data led core repository or the data led core um, package. That's what you've all um, installed and what is on the, on the system. But for special purpose software, for special purpose commands, we create separate Python packages that add additional um, commands to data led's command suite. 
um, those are not, you know, um, those may be, might be special use cases. So for example, not everyone uses the open science framework. So it's just a separate installation such that those people that want to use the open science framework can download that separately to extend the commands the data lab can do. And what the, what the uh, so-called uh, data lab dash OSF extension adds to data lab are commands to publish the data set, including the Git history and the annex contents to the OSF and cloning um, from the OSF with this special URL that I've already um, briefly shown you. Um, here's a quick, I hope this is visible in the screen share, it's just uh, a GIF. So here's how it would look like um, publishing to a Git repository hosting service with Annex support. You can see here that I've created a little data set and I'm currently adding a, a file from the web and saving it. And if I go to, to Jim and create a new repository and add it as a sibling data set, as a remote that I can push these updates to, then because Jim is capable of also hosting the annexed contents, I can run a data lab push command without any further configuration of additional third party hosting services and data lab push will uh, push everything. And if I go to the web interface, I can even have a preview of those annexed contents in the web interface. And that's quite neat. Um, for the OSF, it looks uh, different, um, but similar. Um, if I install the required Python package data lit OSF, I can use data lit create sibling OSF with a title um, for that uh, new project on OSF. And what um, Datalet will do, it will create under my user account uh, that it, if it doesn't have the user account, it will ask for it from the command line, this new project. And if I then run Datalet push to that sibling, I will be able to um, update that OSF project with all of the local changes that I have, including the um, annexed files uh, that can be hosted on the OSF. Um, the only uh, inconvenience there is that the OSF is, is limited in, in the amount of data it can host for you. So you won't be able to publish like a complete, a complete neural imaging study there. Um, and then if, if that is published, I can you know, refresh that project and uh, it will contain the file content. I see a raised hand. Yeah, just have one question. So that's when you, um, so, the history of your changes like on OSF will not appear on the OSF, right? No, no, you don't okay. have this like overview. Um, okay, but well, I, yeah, you probably don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that they don't support um, displaying it. But if you- Yeah, but maybe it, you also don't, I mean, maybe you want to end up with a finished product and not the entire history, right? Oh yeah, uh, and I mean also that's 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 possible. Um, so I, I need to refer you to the to the documentation of that software, um, and that one has has tutorials. It has different modes uh, okay. because uh, you you are able to to use the OSF in in a way that allows you to not publish all of the history, but just create a snapshot of the most recent file state, and then push that there. And I think that's that the use case to export a human readable data set to the OSF. And, and that gives you the commands to create the sibling. And then it, it, it has this mode that is called export only. And when you, when you run that or when you use that instead of the default mode, then it will just update the, uh, upload the most recent snapshot. Uh, so that's when you don't want the history at all. Okay. Uh, I think I see another raised hand. But in other words, the yeah. OS of history will not be uh, the Git history. The OS of history will be today uh, data lab deposited some things packaged in its own way, but it won't be able to use in the flow, for example. Um, I have a question about Jin. Does it basically like um, like GitHub, but it also supports big files, I assume? Yes. Um, does it support private repositories? Because yes. I mean, be a really cool thing uh, just 
during as an additional backup. It's that sounds really cool. It does. Okay. It does. Awesome. It does. Um, yeah, and then there's another special case uh, that's not going to be applicable to many people, but in the case you want to have, like, if you if you want to be a data provider, um, then uh, something that I want to draw your attention to is what is called RIA stores. This is a highly technical um, concept. It's our backup solution for data led data sets that has uh, a number of advantages that will sound pretty technical, but it's something that you could um, that you could excite your system administrator with, for example. It's essentially a very lightweight um, way without um, almost any software dependencies to store large amounts of data sets in very few um, files. So systems, uh, there are file systems um, or services that uh, charge you for the amount of files that are stored on the system. That's called iNodes. If you have such a system, then you are incentivized to keep the number of files that you store there pretty small. A RIA store would, for example, allow you to represent a data set with any amount of files and uh, any size, any total disk usage size in just about 25 files. Um, it's something that we base a lot of computing on our in, in our institute on, um, but it may not be you know, the um, kind of thing that you're looking for if you just want to use it um, for yourself. Uh, but if you're interested in it, then there's a tutorial that uh, you know takes you through the process of creating these things or interacting with these things uh, freely available on GitHub. Um, data led 016, so the most recent version, comes um, with a number of integrations or convenience commands that allow you to not leave your terminal in order to create a sibling. Uh, it's completely up to you whether you want to leave your terminal. You know, some people like to use the web interface, also the repository hosting services, they make it really easy and convenient and nice. So if you if you want to use those, it's, it's not a problem, but there are some people that, that do not want to leave the terminal that often want to do everything from the command line. And there are a couple of convenience commands. You've seen me use them in the, in the, in the GIFs that I've included in the slide um, to create the siblings automatically. Um, those commands, uh, create sibling GitHub to create a GitHub repository, create sibling GitLab for GitLab, create sibling Gin for Gin, create sibling Gox for any Gox instance. Gox is basically an open source version of GitHub that you can host yourself. Um, then there's the data that create sibling command that allows you to create siblings on your local computer for on local paths or on remote infrastructure such as your server so you can say data like create sibling my username at my server and then it will create a repository or a data set there uh, ria stores have one it's called data like create sibling ria and the open science framework uh, has a special command that you get if you install data led osf with a package manager such as conda or pip and that's called data let create sibling OSF. And there are a lot of other services that we're working on. Um, we're a fairly small team of people. So if you have a service that you are really interested in using, then let us know because then it might help us prioritize those things. Um, a really exciting um, piece that is currently being worked on is WebDev that includes, for example, Skibo. Uh, accounts and I think we're in the works of basically a publish to anywhere um, command where you can just you know give a URL to any kind of place on the web and it will it will try its best to create a, a data set sibling there um, but those are all in the works and if you have something that you want to see supported then get in touch so just as one last um, overview of how um, the process looks like from a consumer perspective, depending on where you obtain those data sets from. When you have a local path on the very same machine, then you just say data let clone path to my data set. And then data let get retrieves those files that are annexed automatically from the local path. That's a really fast operation. 
it's useful, for example, if you have data sets on your uh, shared infrastructure that a lot of people have access to in a central location. Mm -hmm. If you clone from a server or a compute cluster, then you don't use the local path, but you use the remote path that includes your username and the IP address of the domain name of the server that you're talking to, as well as the path of the data set. And the data let get will then retrieve those annex contents via network, via, via the internet from, from that server. Uh, typically, that is um, via something that's called an SSH connection. Um, if you clone from a repository hosting service on the web, then you take the URL that is provided by the repository hosting service. Um, when you click on that little button, clone this repository um, and uh, clone that as a sibling to your local computer. And then data like get will retrieve the annexed files more or less regardless of where they are stored as long as you have access to them. Um, that can be the original location. It can be a special remote that was configured. It may need additional configuration by either the user or the data set provider, or it may ask you for authentication so that it can make sure that, you know, the, um, let's say, S3 bucket that you want to access is actually open to you as a specific user. So that's highly dependent on what, what, what special remote is, is storing the data. Um, but um, pretty much regardless of which one it is, it's still the data that get command. It just may be that, you know, uh, it says, hey, uh, this, this is actually not, not available to the public. Please provide your username and your password in order to let me check if you have access to the files that I want to get. Uh, in the special cases that I've already mentioned here, for example, Jin, um, here's how cloning looks like. Uh, you can see in the screenshot that I'm doing it from the from, from our compute cluster um, to have a different computer clone that data set. You can see that I've copied the URL of that repository and I cloned it and then I can get the files and it is uh, retrieved from its origin from from Jin. If I do it with the OSF, uh, I need to provide a special type of URL that is starting with the OSF colon slash slash, and then includes the ID, the unique ID of the project that I want to clone. Um, and here I'm providing also a human readable name for the sibling or for the clone that I'm, that I'm creating, because else it would be called uh, 6v2hb. And it uh, clones the data set from the OSF. It looks just like a normal data set once I've cloned it. And if I retrieve the file contents that are annexed in this data set, they are downloaded, they are retrieved um, from the OSF. And because that's a, you know, a public project, there's nothing that, that needs to be authenticated against. Um, so the, the summary, the quick brief summary on data publication is, uh, First of all, uh, in case there's a fire in your building and you're working on your stuff and you have everything saved, the very first thing that you run is data let push to whatever sibling there is so that uh, you evacuate yourself, but you also evacuate your data by keeping the backup uh, on a remote sibling in sync. Um, so to, 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 yeah, to just summarize the main points, data let data sets can have any number of siblings. Those are linked clones of the very same data set that exist in other places. Uh, and they can be uh, locally or remotely uh, on um, compute infrastructure. They can be on commercial services, um, Google Drive, Dropbox, on free services, uh, Skibo, uh, or on personal infrastructure in case you happen to have a web server in your basement. Um, typical repository hosting services do not host annex contents. Jin is one notable exception. Uh, and typical storage providers, on the other hand, do not host Git repositories, even though we can trick some storage providers into hosting um, them for us. And despite all of those 
different possible services that are involved in this process of publishing data sets, getting their contents out there, the operations that you perform are pretty much streamlined. You clone from somewhere to retrieve a data set, you get annexed file contents to download them, you push to a remote location to publish data sets or new changes in data sets, and you update in order to pull remote changes into your local data set. And this remains the case, even if the underlying data hosting changes. So if you are going to get a call from another university, you're going to get tenure at the University of Berlin, you're going to start your postdoc in the UK, and you are forced by the university's IT services to take all of your belongings data-wise from their infrastructure and take it with you to a different place, then just by um, providing your data set with the updated availability information and, and pushing that to, let's say, the GitHub repository, which you use to, to share that data, you are able to, to, to provide your data to your data consumers or to yourself by the same means, by the same streamlined commands, even though the hosting services change underneath. That's uh, probably especially useful if you are like a large data provider um, who might frequently switch to, you know, cheaper cloud services and stuff. Um, but it's also useful for you as, as a, you know, part of a group of people that are forced to uh, relocate to different universities over the course of their careers um, and their data and their results being their most valuable asset. Um, and these siblings, they can serve uh, multiple purposes. Um, one of the three major ones are personal backups. Uh, I think Lucas was it who already um, uh, brought that up. It's really nice to have this connected network of, of data sets that you can just easily sync because you are able to work on different systems. You are able to, to, to keep your data safe, um, for example, on Jim. You can uh, use siblings to publicly or privately expose files that you want to share or um, collaborate with selected others. For these cases, um, it's especially useful that a lot of those repository ser services have private options so that you can have private repository that only selected few, your immediate collaborators, your colleagues um, have access to. And they serve as entry points for collaborations for the contributions that other people may have to your datasets. 